because it all started kind of back in my PhD, I guess a decade back or whatever it may be. Uh, we started on a lipid software and we've been working on it for probably 10 years now, um, as well as expanding to PFAS and polymers. And so this has definitely been uh, a long um, project with a lot of people involved. And here are just some of the faces, and I'm happy to give out slides if people want to look in more. Recently, um, I started a company, Innovative Omics, and so now we have our own coders. Um, so Michael Kumar is one, Bernard Brooks, Nan Durrani, so that we can start tackling the software in a more professional way. Um, David Godry has also been working very hard on this project as our part of our new coding team. Generally, the software, whether you're doing lipids or anything else, works pretty similarly from the user perspective. You take your LCHRMS MS data and you want full scan for all your samples. That could be a data dependent analysis as long as you get about 11 scans across a peak or more. Um, or you could do all your MSMS on pools, maybe by treatment type. And that's often what we recommend with iterative exclusion approach, uh, which seems to give you about double the amount of annotations than just using data dependent. We can talk about that more too, if you want. Uh, and then we always recommend in our software, um, doesn't mandate, but uh, can make use of, and we highly recommend to use extraction blanks so that you can remove all of the background contaminants from your data set. Because even if you confirm something with high confidence, but you don't have blanks, you don't know if it's actually from your sample or not. So this is the iterative exclusion approach uh, done with Tim Garrett, which many of you probably are familiar with on the Garrett lab. And so we wrote a script and the script's available as well. So if you can't afford thermos, uh, which they sell along with their instruments or it doesn't come with your instrument, uh, you can use this open source software works for Agilent or any type of vendor to generate these exclusion lists in an iterative fashion, uh, and then you re-inject your sample, and then it takes the next most abundant ions. And for lipids, this is really cool because when we use iterative exclusion, especially because the spectra is so dense, there's so many lipids, um, that you don't get MSMS for all of them when you're only taking the top most abundant ions. But when you use iterative exclusion, you get nearly double. So this is something I've shown probably for the past 10 years. And something really interesting here is that you get odd chain and short chain diglycerides, for example, when you start using this approach because it's getting MSMS for the low abundant ions. That might be, for example, bacteria related or, or maybe from a different synthetic pathway. So you get totally different biology using this approach. So highly recommended. Once you get your data acquisition, um, then the real bottleneck for most people is the data processing interpretation. And so that's what I found out uh, over a decade ago and since then have been working on software to try to ease this process. And just recently, and this is probably the first time I'm presenting this software, uh, which you'll see we've added a visualization component to validate. So that's what I'll mostly be focusing on. The way the software works is you drag files on. I'll show you the interface. And it covers file conversion, peak picking, blank filtering, annotation. Uh, there's a separate one you can use for normalization if you want to lipid standards. Or uh, a lot of people here are probably expert users who have their own peak picking algorithms optimized uh, for their use. You can use your own peak picking, have a peak table, and then use lipid match to do the annotation visualization off of that table. Um, so two different options. I often just use the flow even myself, where I just drag the files and click go. I trust our p-pigging, and it's very easy. And then here's the visualizer. So for the user to run their data, all you have to do is draw, drag in the vendor files into the appropriate boxes. Uh, so negative mode, positive mode files, and MSMS files. Um, and then you can pretty much click go. There's some blank filtering parameters. There's also other parameters such as MSMS intensity for file conversion and annotation. Uh, you can close your windows on your retention time and your mass to charge uh, so that it doesn't do peak picking on everything just to speed things up. 
uh, threshold things here. Other, these are new features for those that are familiar with Lip and Match. Um, this one, you can drag files in here that are peak list. So if you had a peak list of your standards or just compounds you know you see in these samples over and over again, their retention time and their mass to charge, you can import them here and they'll make sure to annotate and peak pick those as part of the process while it's doing the non-targeted peak picking as well. Also, we enable statistics, uh, violin plots, volcano plots, things of that nature. So you can import group names, and then as long as your files have those group names in them, you can automatically assign groups and do the stats. So now we're going to look at the visualizer. I'll actually pull up the visualizer, but just to orient you on some of the components. This one, some of you may not be familiar with. So this is a Kendrick mass defect plot. So instead of normalizing the periodic table to C12, where 12 carbon 12 is 12 point zero 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 zero. You normalize to CH2. Uh, so that would be 14 point zero 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 zero. So now any mass defect is related to heteroatoms, uh, phosphates, you know, different groups that you might get the head group of your lipid, as well as unsaturations. And so you get this really cool pattern here where going diagonally, you get um, more degrees of unsaturation. And then going horizontally, you get increasing carbon numbers. So you can automatically kind of tell what types of lipids may exist in your data set, even if they're not annotated by MSMS or anything, just using this Kendrick mass defect plot. Um, and then what you can do alongside that is, let's say, in orange are those that were annotated by MSMS, and in pink are those, or purplish pink, are those that have no annotation, you can start pulling out unknowns and try to validate those. And so this visualizer can both be used to validate things that have already been identified, which is very important. The lipid community has put a lot of pressure on people that, hey, you have to look at your data, just not trust the software. So we're enabling that. And, and also, to find unknowns or new lipids that may never have been discovered before. Um, so let's go into the software itself. Can people see this screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is this visualiz visualizer platform. And I just pulled up some glycerophospholipid region and this is for tilapia plasma, uh, some work we did with John Bowden from University of Florida. And I can take any class that's already been annotated using kind of fatty acids and head groups and the normal thing. And I can pull those out and you can see these nice patterns. Um, so if I wanted to validate compounds, for example, I could look across, like we said, from left to right and see some of these patterns. So. Okay, here's um, a series, series 31, just a random number assigned to that series. Um, and if I click that, now all of a sudden I just have that straight line for those um, that have six unsaturations and then deferring numbers of carbons. And now we can see in our retention time mass to charge plot, this very nice um, trend over here and retention time mass to charge. And so that gives me extra confidence. Not only were these assigned using MSMS nicely, but also have a nice plot here. I can also see these nice isotopic patterns that look pretty similar across with the C13. I could zoom in and look at any one of those. They label them too. So here's a C13 peak. Here's a C13, two C13 peaks. Also kind of overlaps with the oxygen, so you can't tell and it gives you um, the abundance of those potential isotopes. And then you can also see the EICs here nicely and kind of tell that for most of these 22 colon six species, there's isomers. So looking, there's an isomer. There's generally two major isomers for all these different 22 colon six species. There's an isomer there, uh, which is interesting. So those different positions of the unsaturation on the double bond most likely or it could be different SM1, SM2 positions. Now, that's 
really nice for validating species. And you can see how quickly I can validate and go through these. But also we can do some discovery of unknowns or at least things that weren't annotated before. So let's unselect PCs, unselect um, this 31. And let's say I want everything that has fatty acid of 20 colon five, that fragment that was observed. The nice thing in negative mode is you get these fatty acid fragments that are baseline fragments, so very high abundance. Boom, I click those. You can see this NA here. So here's two that weren't annotated, um, but clearly have that 20 colon five. So I could click this one over here and we can see some isotopic pattern. We can see the nice 20, well, let's see. This is the neutral loss of the, there's the 20 colon five fatty acid related fragment. You can see it also has a 22 colon six fragment. Um, here are some exact mass matches. Um, here's a potential ID. So um, a plasma LPS with an ether link 20 colon zero and 25. And it just saw one of those fatty acids, yeah? So for low abundant ions, sometimes you might not see everything. So you can start going in here and trying to discover unknowns. One easy way to add annotations in that weren't annotated automatically is to pull out a series with known annotations and then find unknowns as well. So let's go back to the PCs, pull out, um, let's see, something with 20 colon five in it. All right, so we get this nice series over here, um, which is series 37. So I'm going to pull out 37, unselect. Um, and now you can see some of the unknowns as well. And you can see them fall nicely within the retention time mass to charge pattern, some of them. Uh, so not 100% confirmed, but definitely wouldn't exclude any of these as possibilities. And then you could start looking at isotopic patterns if they exist. Um, so here's a nice isotopic pattern. You can see the peak, make sure it's a nice peak, so on and so forth. So pretty helpful. Um, a lot of different filters. So you can filter by the number of series, what MSMS file things were annotated. As I showed here, probably one of the most useful filters is you could filter by types of fragments and show those that have certain fatty acids, um, so on and so forth. So um, that's the general idea of the software. A nice thing too is that, let's see if I have one um, that has the stats in it. So this is probably going to be more a PFAS application. And something to mention here is that this framework, like most mass spectrometry software, can be used for anything. It's, it's building the libraries that's really challenging. So if I want a new application, we need to know how things fragment, what kind of homologous series form. But the framework can be used for anything. So we're doing polysorbates, polysorbides. We're doing PFAS, so on and so forth. But we have this nice um visual for the stats as well if you have groupings so that other application didn't have groupings that's why there was no stats and so then you can do cool things too like filter by p-value this is using some of the r um metaboanalyst package in the background and then you know click things that have very significant differences and start to look into what they may be using this non-targeted kind of data approach uh, that we just showed with different fragments assigned, things like that. And so you could narrow down your unknowns to those that are significantly different as well. Um, so that really helps. And so I think I'm going to leave it pretty short uh, because I'd rather discuss with you guys than uh, keep talking at you. But I think you got the idea that this is getting to a really cool place. So let's talk. Great. Yeah. So. I would like to talk about untargeted NMR metabolomics using the MR bin package. Um, my name is Matthias Klein. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an assistant professor here at the Department of Food Science and Technology and the Foods for Health Discovery theme 
at the Ohio State University. Uh, I'm also, I've got a courtesy appointment in the Department of Entomology here. So this is kind of where I'm based. And um, yeah, so <clears throat> I know we're switching topics really quickly here now, like you've heard a lot about uh, mass spec approaches. So now we're back at NMR uh, metabolomics. I would just like to introduce you real quick because I guess some of you have never used NMR for metabolomics. So NMR is a technique that measures proton precession frequencies for structural information. So that means um, the protons in a molecule, they're, if you disturb them, they will precess, like they have kind of a funny, funky movement. And you can measure that using like coils in a giant magnetic field. And uh, this will give you a spectrum. And this can tell you like what is in that, in that mixture, basically, if you have a mixture, like you can also use it to <clears throat> figure out the molecular structure of a pure compound, but that's not what we're doing here. So this is a typical 1D proton NMR spectrum. So this is measuring proton frequencies. You can use NMR to measure carbon-13, for example, or phosphorus, or a lot of different uh, nuclei, but this is, I would say, the most common one for NMR metabolomics. And you can do this in, like, you can analyze these data in two different ways. So either you can use a targeted approach, which is also known as a quantitative approach. And in these approaches, you, you're just looking for peaks that you already know. For example, you might know, well, I don't know, these two peaks belong to citric acid. I want to know how much citric acid do we have in here. So you look for these peaks or let a computer look for them, analyze the peak intensity or the area under the peak. And that will give you information about the, the quantity, like the a concentration of that compound. And targeted approaches like have the drawback that they just will find what you're looking for. So that's kind of the, the drawback of this. Um, however, they are widely used like these approaches. And there's a lot of different products available for, for doing this with NMR. And I don't even want to mention them. Like there's a lot of them. Um, but this is really not what I'm so much interested in. So I've been using mostly untargeted NMR. Uh, so untargeted approaches in NMR are still quantitative uh, just because NMR has so many quantitative aspects, uh, but they're untargeted. So they will look at the whole spectrum basically. Uh, and the nice thing is you don't, you don't know what molecules you will find. You might find something that you didn't expect. You might find something that's not in a database. Maybe it's an unknown thing. However, like, or you might, will just fi find that <clears throat> what, what you were expecting. So that's kind of the, the beauty of this approach. Uh, to do this in NMR, we use something called spectral binning. So in this sample uh, spectrum, we just divide this spectrum into chunks that are called bins or buckets. And you just basically sum up everything, all signals that are within each chunk. And you continue just doing math and statistics with those numbers. Uh, this has some interesting or like positive outcomes, like this is reducing the data amount you're dealing with. You're just reducing the dimensionality of your data. Uh, also, this can correct for slight differences in peak positions. So if you've used NMR, you know that if the pH is even a little off or the salt concentration differs, these signals tend to wander off. And if these bins are broad enough, like the signal will still stay in there, even though it's visibly not super overlapping anymore. So this might correct for, for some of these small differences. Um, there are some issues, of course, with this. One is typical NMR issue is that we, you might have negative values in your data. Uh, so. I guess that's not happening so much with other approaches, but this, that's very typical in NMR. You have negative values, and that usually means that you're close to the baseline, like there is just no or hardly any signal there. Um, but it's still met causing a lot of issues for the data analysis. So that's one issue that uh, I've been thinking about uh, like for the last years, how to, to work on this. 
Um, when doing untargeted NMR metabolomics, there's not so many products really out there that are doing a good job at that. I used to use Brooker Amix. So that's a commercial software that you can see here uh, by Brooker, which is the one of the, well, now it's the most, like the biggest uh, manufacturer of NMR spectrometers. Um, and this is working reasonably well, Brooker Amix. However, it's kind of not very stable. It's frequently crashing, especially when using this with big data sets. You don't have really a lot of options in terms of treating the data, normalizing, scaling, noise handling, things like that. And also the biggest drawback is that Amix uh, is no longer supported by Bruker. So they've replaced it uh, by some other tool and they don't offer the same uh, options anymore. So you can still use it. You can still pay a lot of money to use it and uh, but you get kind of a 10 year old program that, well, might do what you want to do it, but it might not. So that was kind of the, the reason why I started writing something myself that, that does what I want to do. And I think it might be really helpful for us, for other researchers as well. And this is the MR bin package, or you might call it Mr. Bin. So uh, as, as you like it really, it stands for magnetic resonance binning, integration and normalization. And this is an R package. You can find it on CRAN. Uh, so it's like anybody who can install R can install this and use it uh, uh, it's widely and of course for free, uh, widely available for free. And just to show you what this really does, like the scope of MR bin. It does only what is in this red box. It does not do, of course, anything with NMR measurements. It does not do data pre-processing, not Fourier transform, window functions, phase correction, baseline correction. That's all not what it does. It does specifically the spinning, data cleanup, data scaling, data normalization. And also it does some unsupervised data analysis steps like PCA for like initial analysis. So this is kind of, relatively narrow in its scope. It does not do compound identification. Of course, it doesn't do biological interpretation, um, but it's kind of narrow and I think it, it does a good job at, at this. Uh, the target audience, I mean, of course, like this can be used by experts and I think it's going beyond what Amix was able to do. But when I wrote this, I was really focused on unexperienced users. So like, let's say I will have an intern in my lab or an undergraduate student, sometimes even a high school student. Uh, those people might not have ever used R or any other command line tool. So they might have no idea about this, but they should still be able to generate data. So, and have the flexibility of getting into R. So that's kind of the people I had in mind here. Uh, especially I wanted to make data visible uh, to spot issues. And I think we heard it already today, like look at your data. That's a really important thing to do. Like don't just put all your data into a pipeline and never look at it anymore, but you, you really should look at that. And if you don't look at the data, you might just miss important things that are going on. Uh, this also included automatic checks. Uh, for example, missing reference signals in some spectra, baseline issues. So those should usually raise a flag in the in the tool. Um, also, in, it included some new algorithms for noise handling and for fixing negative values. So if you want to read more about that, um, uh, that, that this is published. This is the ATNV algorithm for fixing negative values. But I wouldn't say that's the main uh, part of the software. And I would like to really give you a quick demonstration of this in R, and I hope this works. So let me just take a look at my, let's switch to R here, if possible. Can you see R? Great, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, I've installed the package, I've loaded it, and to run an MR bin, you just type something like uh, MR bin, and you, where you want to save your results. And 
this is really like different than most M uh, R packages in, in terms of that you don't put all your parameters in at the command line, but this will really guide you through a, a whole process. So it will ask you like review your parameters or reload an old data set. And I will just guide you like go through this with you real quick. So it will ask you 1D or 2D spectra. It can do both. We'll just do a 1D spectrum here to browse for NMR data. We need to add a starting point here because CDRAN doesn't allow us to like browse users' hard drives. So you have to ask the user for getting started with that. So we can go to um, Brooker, Topspin, Data. Those of you who have used NMR like might know this kind of typical like hideout for NMR data. Okay, and the software will look for NMR spectra and let you just select from a list. And I'll just pick a few, few random spectra here just to demonstrate this. Okay, so you can add additional spectra to that list if they are in a different folder, if you like, but we'll just keep it here. And MRBIN will ask you to review the spectra. And if you do this, which you should, which is the <clears throat> standard behavior, it will show you a preview of each and every spectrum in your data set. And this is really forcing the users to look at their data. Like, uh, and I'll just click through here. Like, this looks okay initially. The next spectrum also looks okay. This one looks okay to me visually. This one looks fine. Um, so, but if anything were wrong, like badly wrong with a spectrum, you would see it here and you could just click on cancel and go back to your data, fix those issues before you get, before you run into big trouble. Okay, so these all look kind of okay. So we'll just continue here. MRBIN can use a couple of different binning methods. Like the most common one would be rectangular bins. Like you just split the whole spectrum into bins of equal size. You could also like use a user-defined list. This might be interesting for lipid analysis. <coughs> know where your lipid signals are living in the spectrum. You just stick with the rectangular bins. And I think you see that here already. Like the software shows you previews all the time of your data. Like this is like really the spectra you selected are shown here overlaid with like the bin region that you might choose. It, it gives you some suggestions, but you can easily adjust that. we we'll just keep it for now here. One very important step here is selecting a bin size. This should roughly match the, the width of a, of a real signal. So therefore it's projecting a, uh, like the selected bin size or bin width to some real data, a zoomed in area of the spectrum. And you can just make that bigger or smaller depending on especially which spectrometer you're using and kind of a little bit depending on your, your data. You can select if you want to scale to a reference signal, which is usually a really good thing to do in NMR. Uh, this here would be a preview of the reference region and like the green area here. And what you see here now is that the reference signal is not at all in the reference region like that we're selecting here. And this is just because like obviously the reference, the automatic referencing didn't work for these spectra. And this is frequently happening. And uh, now we're spotting this, right? Usually we could click on cancel here now and go back to your, our data and fix that, like do the referencing right. If we don't look at our data, we will miss that. I will I will not fix this for now, but but a user would be forced to see these these mistakes here. So we'll just keep this. We can remove the solvent area. In this case, we have no big solvent area. This would usually be a huge peak here. It's not there because this is an extract and deuterated solvent. We'll just keep we we'll just keep on like for for this example. Uh, removing this. You could remove additional areas, like if you have multiple solvents or a solvent that has multiple signals, uh, you could just des designate some areas to remove from the analysis. You could merge some bins of peaks that are known to wander around pretty much between spectra, for example, citric acid, but you can just like 
not do that for now. Um, then you can select like where should your example names come from? Should that be the folder names, the spectrum titles, or kind of a mix? So we'll just select spectrum titles here. You can crop these for the plot if you like, if they're too long. You can save the output to, uh, to, to the hard drive if you like. We'll not do that for now. And also it will give you an estimate for how long this will take. This will take about zero minutes. Especially for 2D spectra, this might take 20 minutes. I just want to give the user a heads up that this might take a while. I, I usually get nervous if, if R is calculating and like kind of freezing and you don't know what's happening. Like, will that take a year or five minutes? And so this is kind of giving you an estimate how long it will roughly take. So we can start binning now here. And now it's doing what it's doing basically. It's using parallel uh, mode if possible to speed that up a little bit. And this is kind of an, a result output plot you're getting. This is kind of a preview of the spectral area you were analyzing. This is a feature-wise box plot. This is a sample-wise box plot. And this is a PCA plot. And it's not showing groups because I didn't want to push the users to think about like group differences here, but but really looking at data quality. And also like I'm really pointing the users toward like they might have issues here. They should fix them. And only if they have really acknowledged that they have fixed all spectrum issues, they can continue. And then we can do some noise removal, which is really important. So we just select noise removal. You can define an area which is used to define the noise level for each spectrum individually. And so we just keep this for the as the noise area. And it's calculating some previews here of the noise levels. So, so these previews here are just picking a few sample spectra out of your own list and showing zoomed in regions with signals and where the noise level would be, where the noise cutoff would be that you've selected. So this is a signal to noise ratio of 25 here now. And what you see here is some strong signals are well above that. Uh, some, some maybe interesting signals are below that. So they, those would usually get lost. So this is kind of giving the user the flexibility. They could reduce that a little bit if they like. So um, we, could, we could just play around with that factor here. If you're happy with this, you can just click on OK. Go to sleep, you little baby. OK. So what we see here now is um, sometimes or frequently, you will not see a signal in every spectrum, especially if you have things like urine, human urine. You might just see a signal in some spectra. So here you can select in how many spectra do you want to see a signal? So you don't discard it. So this would be like a preview. This would be 75% of the spectra, like uh, has to have to have a visible peak there. If you remove that, you get more and more signals after noise removal left. So you have more noise included here. If you increase that too much, you get closer to zero. You have less noise, but also less true signals. So we'll just leave it here. You could do things like dilution correction. You can do things like PQN normalization, which I really like. So I'll select this. For PQN correction in NMR, I've realized that just because the glucose signal is so broad in NMR, it's sometimes dominating PQN. So you can ignore most of that if you want to. You could fix negative values here if you like. You could do log transform unit variance scaling, all kinds of scaling me mechanisms. And then it's just doing this. And this is kind of your final output. So you're seeing here which areas of your spectrum were really retained. Like anything that is green is being used. This is signals. Anything that's white here is just noise. Uh, you see a new, new feature-wise and sample-wise block plots. You see a PCA plot. And also you get this chunk here, this is like, if you just copy and paste this into R, it will just do like everything we did now, 
with user input, it will do that like automatically to re repeat, reproduce what you just did. And so that's kind of the basic workflow. The data is now stored in a object that's that's an, a, a new kind of object. It's an, an MR bin object in R. Um, this is kind of uh, documented. So anything that you did to that object is uh, kind of saved in the object. So to see what happened, you can do a check MR bin and the name of the object. And it will tell you like the data was processed as follows, reference scaled, zero trimmed, noise removed, PQN scaled. The data seems to be valid. All changes have been documented. I included this just because I've realized, especially if somebody is new to coding, they might just inadvertently run the same line of code twice or so. And then you don't really know what happened to your data before you analyze it. So for example, if a student might want to do the PQN scaling once more, like I included a command for doing the PQN scaling. And if you do that, if you try this here, it says, tells you error data has been PQN scaled previously, this could corrupt the data. So you couldn't usually multiple times do the same thing to the data. And also like this would make it really easy to spot, well, if something went wrong with the data inadvertently. So I've seen this happening a lot of times and this would just, I think, help avoiding some of these issues. And after that, like within, like if you want to see your data, it's in an object called bins in here, and we can just get a quick preview here. Like this is what your data looks like now. Like here you have uh, the rows are the different samples and the columns are the different frequencies, spectral frequencies of the signals that are left in the data set. So this is kind of a quick introduction. I just have a few more comments. Okay, I'll just switch to the next slide here. Some additional details. This works with 1D and 2D data, for example, HSQC spectra, like this is what it looks for these, looks like for these. Um, I'm a big fan of 2D NMR for metabolomics, um, although it's quite time consuming. Um, all changes are documented. You can view all processing steps and this makes it easier to write up a manuscript or a thesis like, like verifying what did you do to the data at all. Um, if you want to further process your data, you can use a command called edit MR bin, and then that will go into the documentation of the whole of the whole workflow. Um, you can annotate signals. If you know some signals are some molecules, you can do that. Uh, this will help in uh, visually seeing what's going on. Sometimes in NMR, one molecule might, well, might be visible in multiple regions of the spectrum. So this would help you to see, well, okay, these all of these 10 signals are the same thing, actually. Um, you could also add metadata to these objects, like uh, pretty much anything that you want to add to these, to these objects for your data analysis. You could also keep that in a separate object, of course. And currently this works with Bruker data. Um, and yeah, so with this, I would like to acknowledge everybody who has been working with this and helping developing this. Thank you so much. And yeah, my, my funding agencies, of course, and thank you so much you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>